Okay, uh, can you hear me? I'm guessing yes. Um, uh, maybe I leave this here. I move this here. Okay, um, so yesterday uh, I explained uh, how to construct two maps in the Hosh Tate uh, spectral sequence, or really the Hosh Tate decomposition, in the case of elliptic curves. And I was trying to give some, ex uh, I was trying to give you an explicit example of how the general construction works. So today I want to talk a little bit about the general construction of uh, the Hosh Tate spectral sequence. Um, Maybe this is the pen. No. Okay, great. So the setup is going to be as follows. Uh, so C over QP is a complete and algebraically closed field. Uh, X over C is a proper, smooth, rigid space, which I will always think of as an attic space. Uh, and I will comment on where the assumptions uh, are relevant. So it turns out properness is relevant for one part and smoothness is relevant for the other part. And so I'll try to make it clear when uh, they come up. And the goal uh, of today is to sort of explain how to construct this Hosh Tate spectral sequence. So HTSS is my abbreviation for Hosh Tate spectral sequence. Uh, by uh, descent from perfectoid spaces, as I sort of indicated yesterday. So I'll say more precisely what I mean. Um, and so yesterday, what we saw in this uh, construction of the second map, the map I think I called beta for an elliptic curve, is you sort of look at this big uh, cover of your elliptic curve, which is the inverse limit of multiplication by p. You have some nice structure up there in the inverse limit, and then you try to descend it back down. And so you don't have such covers globally for uh, any proper smooth space. Uh, you use something very special about elliptic curves there. But you always have them locally. And so we need some kind of a formalism that takes the argument from yesterday and makes it somehow more local. And so this is this uh, formalism of the Fourier tile site. So i.e., we're going to construct uh, a map, which I'll call new. So it'll be a map of sites, and I'll explain what the objects are. So there'll be something called the pro tile site of X. Uh, it'll have a structure sheaf on it, which is OX hat, and it will map down to the tile site with sort of the usual structure sheaf there. So we will construct these objects, and then it will turn out that the Hodge Tate spectral sequence is actually just the Loray spectral sequence for this morphism. So construct a map such that the Hodge Tate spectral sequence, which I remind you, looks like HI of x, omega j of x over c, j twisted by minus j, converging to h i plus j of x q p ten third c, uh, is the Loray spectral sequence for nu. So this one is just the spectral sequence you get from a composition of derived functors. So h i downstairs of the jth push forward from upstairs is uh, supposed to converge to the cohomology upstairs. Uh, OX hat. And, and so this is the plan. And so what, what I need to explain is, first of all, what is this object X proital and what is this sheaf OX hat on it? Once I've explained that, there are two, con uh, two statements being made here. Uh, one is, why is the sheaf of differential forms actually given by the jth push forward uh, of new lower star OX hat? So we are seeing differential forms as arising by pushing forward a structure sheaf from the pro etal side down to the etal side, which is this fact I was saying that you're going to see differential forms reappearing via some kind of a descent procedure. Pushing forward along this map is what I meant by descent from the pro etal setting. And then we have to explain why the cohomology of the structure sheaf OX hat on the pro etal side is actually just the etal cohomology we were interested in. Uh, and so that's the plan. And uh, so, right, so let me just write down the three steps. So, we have three tasks. So, one is to construct this map mu. The second task is to show that 
these push forwards are what they should be. And the third task is to show that the cohomology of OX hat is what it should be. So. Uh, and so it's, it turns out that in this uh, case, uh, one and two only require smoothness, or one really doesn't require anything. So this is the part that needs smoothness, but not properness. And this is the part that needs properness, but not smoothness. And so the combination of those two uh, will then tell us uh, what we were looking for. Is that okay? All right, so I want to make one remark which maybe slightly clarifies uh, some I think rather cryptic comment I made on the first day, which ended up confusing a lot of people. Uh, so I said on the first day that uh, this uh, work of Conrad and Gaber on uh, spreading out rigid analytic families tells you that the Hoch state spectral sequence always degenerates. So, I mean, the rough idea is that you know that the Hoch state spectral sequence degenerates if you're defined over a small field because you have a Galois action, and the Galois action forces the differentials to be zero. And then what Brian and uh, Gaber show is uh, that you can always spread out your rigid analytic space into a family where there are a lot of points defined over a small field. And over a small field, you can use uh, the Galois theoretic argument to prove that the differentials are zero. And since there are tons of points where differentials are zero, you can specialize to the large field. Uh, but this argument, uh, and then I said that it doesn't canonically degenerate. And that's kind of a bullshit statement. So what I really mean is that there is not somehow a good reason for it to degenerate. The best possible reason for it to degenerate would be that uh, uh, the complex you're taking the cohomology of actually ends up decomposing into a direct sum of its cohomology groups. And that is what fails. So however, uh, this complex, our new lower star OX hat, is not a direct sum. Why is it a direct sum? Uh, why can you always lift your thing to mod C squared? Maybe. I, I'm just confused about something there. Um, okay, so let me make a I think what is a correct statement, which is if I put a plus over here, it's not true. Do you agree with that statement, Peter? Okay, so Peter is not unhappy, which is good enough. Uh, so there is, there is a plus version of the sheaf, which I will describe, and uh, the non-plus version is obtained from the plus version by inverting P. Uh, and so the best possible statement would be if the plus version was actually a direct sum, and that is definitely not true. Okay. Um, One. Okay, so let's let's actually define these objects. Um, so the pro tile side. And so the definition has evolved uh, somehow over time. Uh, same problem yesterday. What? Uh, yeah. I can't advertise my home department then. What? Uh, not in the math department. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, right, so the pro tells like the definition is evolved over time, and I'm using uh, the definition that's uh, essentially what appeared in Peter's uh, piatic Hosh theory paper, the first one. Um, I think subsequently some people have called it the old pro tells site, and then Kirana suggested calling it the flattened pro tells site, but I'm just going to call it the pro tells site for now. So let's say X is a smooth attic space over C. Uh, and the definition of the site is as follows. So let me tell you what the objects are. So the objects are uh, certain uh, projective systems of atal morphisms to X. So they're pro-objects. 
So I'll denote them like so, uh, brackets ui of the tall side of x. And then they satisfy the condition that the transition maps are uh, eventually finite at all and surjective. So they might not be so for small values, but for large, i bigger than j, this is true. So for example, uh, you could take just an open subset of x. That would give you an object of the etale side. And then you could have a big tower of finite etale covers of these objects. And this is actually the kinds of objects we're going to be interested in, towers of finite etale covers of uh, small open subsets. Um, and so these are the objects. And then the, it's a full subcategory. So that tells you what the morphisms are. And there exists a natural notion of uh, coverings, which I don't want to get into. It's slightly subtle to define, and uh, in the examples I'm going to talk about, it, it's obviously going to be a covering, and those are the ones I will focus on. Um, so it is this site which is kind of like the Atal site, except you want to sort of throw in these towers of finite Atal covers, and they will, it will buy us something very concrete. Uh, so I will tell you what the main theorems are, which uh, tell you the site is a good idea, but let me sort of give some examples. So the first example is maybe that any Etal morphism is pro, uh, as an object of the pro etal side. So any u inside x etal gives you a u, which is just the constant diagram inside x pro etal, um, just regard it as a constant pro system. And so this actually, this construction actually gives you a functor, which is a map of sites. So you get this map new. So this is a morphism of sites, which means that it, the, map, the, map, the map on the categories of open sets goes in the other direction. And in the other direction, it's saying that an etal morphism is pro etal. Um, and so we're going to be interested in certain sheaves over here, which come via pullback, uh, followed by certain uh, completion operations. And then the second example is something that came up in my talk yesterday. So let's say x is an elliptic curve. Then we had this diagram yesterday, which I called E infinity, or maybe there was a fancier version of E, which was uh, just the tower of multiplication by P maps. Uh, and so multiplication by P on an elliptic curve over a field of characteristic zero is a finite etal map. So this is a tower of finite etal covers of E, and so it defines for you uh, an object of the pro etal site. And this is the kind of object you're going to be interested in. We all have some base object we're interested in, like E, and then you have a huge tower of finite tall covers of these objects. X is E, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. OK, and then the example we're actually going to be interested in is not something proper like E, because it's hard to do sort of construct these pro etal covers over something proper, but rather something much smaller where you have more freedom. So the attic torus, or the perfectoid tor the attic torus is uh, sort of going to be our key example today. So x equals t is spa of uh, c t to the plus or minus 1, and then o c to the same thing. So this is, uh, the, I mean, this is the object that represents the functor of giving uh, a unit in R plus um, inside your affinite algebra. And the pro etal cover of this, uh, I will call x infinity or t infinity, that we'll look at is just the tower of multiplication by p maps, or raising to the p power maps on the torus. So it's kind of similar to the previous example. You have a group, and you look at the inverse limit of multiplication by p on the group. Um, and this is an object of x pro et al. Uh, but we'll actually need to work with these objects concretely. So I, I need to give names to, uh, to, to each of these individual t's showing up. So you can also think of this as the tower xn plus 1 to xn all the way down to x0, where this xn is spa of the same ring, but I rename the variable. So it's c adjoin t to the plus or minus 1 over p to the n. And the same thing here. 
And then the transition map is the obvious one, T goes to T. So I think this example has shown up multiple times uh, today. OK, uh, and then, right, I want to talk about torsor. So, so note, each map uh, xn plus 1 into xn is a mu p torsor. Because you're just extracting a p through of an invertible function. That's, uh, that's a cover. Uh, that's a finite etale cover whose Galois group is the, the n throughs of unity, acting, via, uh, the p, acting on the p through in the obvious way. And so therefore, what this somehow suggests is that if you sort of think of x infinity as a cover of x, which is x0, this is actually a zp of one torsor. Um, now, you're not allowed to do this kind of maneuver in algebraic geometry, where you have a compatible system of torsors for various finite groups. You pass to the inverse limit. You can say that what you get is a torsor for the big group if you work with something sort of reasonably finite, like the etale topology. Because the inverse limit does not live in, uh, in the world of finite type objects. But the pro etale topology actually allows you to make sense of this. So uh, I want to sort of make the following remark slash definition, which is, um, right, given any topological space. How do you view the GP of one Right, so I'm about to explain this. Yeah. Uh, so given any topological space like ZP of 1, uh, you get a sheaf on the pro etale side. And I want to call the sheaf Y underline, although a better thing to do to following the, the literature would be F sub Y, but let me just stick to this. Uh, so if you get a sheaf on the pro etale side X via the following formula. So if I give you an object UI, I send it to uh, the space of continuous maps, the set of continuous maps from the inverse limit of the UIs just on topological spaces into Y. And so the point is that the inverse limit of these gadgets is, makes sense as a topological space, and it could actually be a pretty interesting topological space. And it has interesting maps to y. And so this is uh, how I'm going to always think of a topological space, or for example, a topological group as giving a sheaf on the pro etale side. And so this is what I mean over here. So zp of 1 uh, is a profinite group, but as a profinite group is a topological group, so I regard it as a sheaf on the pro etale side in this fashion. It's then a sheaf of groups, and then the, the, I mean, basic, a basic exercise tells you that this map I've constructed here is a torsor for this profinite group viewed as a sheaf in this way. Is that okay? So in my first example, in my second example of the elliptic curve, the map from E infinity all the way down to E is a torsor for the Tate module. So E infinity to E is a TP of E torsor. Sorry? I don't see the oh, site. Uh, right, so I wrote this part. Uh, so E infinity is a TP of E torsor, because at each finite level, you have uh, the, P the P torsion points on E acting on each of these maps, and in the inverse limit, you get an action of the Tate module. And the way the site works is that it tells you that you get a TP of E torsor by taking an inverse limit of these finite torsors. All right, sorry. So an example would be that you take y equals just the field QP with its natural topology. So QP is a topological space, and you can regard it as a sheaf on the pro etale side in this way, uh, y, y underline or QP underline. And this sheaf turns out to be very interesting. So it's a sheaf on the pro etale side. It's a genuine sheaf of abelian groups. And the cohomology of this sheaf of abelian groups is the etale cohomology with QP coefficients. So we have that hi of x pro etale with coefficients in qp underline is sort of the correct etale cohomology of x with qp coefficients. And so this was this problem that I mentioned in the first lecture where if you're thinking of these big sheaves like zp or qp, you can't quite think of it as a sheaf, as the cohomology of an honest sheaf if you're sort of in the world of finite type objects. But if you work in this kind of infinite type setting where you, have, you could possibly have tons of connected components, then you can actually just work with the cohomology of this particular sheaf. And so this is one of the advantages, that it actually brings a sheaf for you for which, whose cohomology you're taking rather than some kind of a pro system of sheaves. So, so can you think of that torsor as an element in H1? 
Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so the, you have... So, sorry, the question was, can I think of these torsos as elements of H1? So, right, so this uh, torso over here gives you an element of H1 of X with coefficients in this group, ZP of 1, on the Proetel site. And the same in the elliptic curve example. Okay, so, right, so we have the Proetel site, uh, but one of, and I, I told you, I guess, one feature of this site, which is that you can actually compute a tau cohomology on the nose as the cohomology of a sheaf. Uh, but that feature is already available in algebraic geometry if you work with the algebra geomet geometric version of the Proetel site. Uh, the thing that's really cool, I think, about the analytic setting is that uh, the Proetel site is locally perfectoid. So it makes precise this idea that every attic space has a cover by something which is perfectoid. So in order to make this actually into a statement, let me make the following definition. So if I have an object U, which is a pro-system UI in the pro-etal side of X, I'll call the, this such an object affinoid perfectoid. If it satisfies the following two properties. So first of all, everything inside is affinoid. So each UI is spa of Ri, Ri plus. And then the limit is a perfectoid object. But you have to be slightly careful about limits in this world. So let me just define what I mean. So set R plus to be the direct limit of the Ri pluses, and then take a p-adic completion, and then set R to be R plus with p inverted. So you get this pair, R, R plus. It's a Huber pair. And the, uh, the axiom is that uh, R, R plus is required to be perfectoid. So it's a collection of uh, sort of nice etal covers, which in the inverse limit is supposed to give you something perfectoid. And we've already seen one example, so now let me uh, do it in coordinates. So the key example of this construction is that of a torus. So let's say x is t, so it's spa of c join t to the plus or minus 1, and then the same thing with oc. Uh, then we saw over here, uh, over here in the previous slide, so for the camera, uh, you have this nice, uh, pro -etal, nice object of the pro-etal side, which is a ZP of 1 torsor, and then the claim is that, that that object is affinite perfectoid. So then x infinity, or this thing that I call t infinity, is affinoid perfectoid. Uh, and so what do we have to check? We actually already have the tower for us. So we know that Xn is spa of OC, sorry, C T to the plus or minus 1 over P to the N, and the same thing with OC. And so these Xn's are going to play the role of the Ri's in the definition. And so what you need to check is that if you look at the completed direct limit of OC, t to the plus or minus 1 over p to the n. Uh, so we need to check, sorry, that this gadget is perfectoid. That's what this condition is telling us to check. But this is perfectoid because this is actually just OC angle brackets, t to the plus or minus 1 over p infinity. I guess that's the definition. Um, and it certainly is perfectoid. It's our basic example of something perfectoid. You take an element and join all of its p power roots, and I guess in this case I'm also inverting it. So therefore, x infinity is actually affinite perfectoid. Is that okay? So this is really some of the key construction for my uh, talk today, which is you can sort of extract these p power roots of the coordinates on the torus to make it perfectoid, and it's perfectoid in this particular sense. Um, right. Uh, I don't want to sort of explain this, so uh, do the same thing for higher dimensional tori as well. I mean, nothing changes. You... This is fine. Okay, uh, so let's continue this example for a second. So I said in this example that in the inverse limit, I have an action of uh, ZP of 1 on x infinity. And so we can ask, what, is, what does this action look like on this coordinate ring that we've written down? In coordinates, how do you describe it? 
Uh, and it's actually very explicit. And I will need this explicit description in a second. So the ZP of one action on X infinity is given as follows. Uh, so, I, so if I give you a generator G of ZP of one corresponding to some element of ZP of one, so I'll call that element epsilon underlined, which is a compatible system of P power roots of P, which has been showing up in many of the talks. Um, uh, the way this element G acts on a monomial of the form T to the I over P to the N, which is an element of this, uh, in, uh, this direct limit over here, is, uh, so you're supposed to look at the P to the Nth root of unity that's acting, which is epsilon sub P to the N, and it's acting on, by weight one on T, and so it's acting by weight I on T to the I over P to the N. Okay, so you just have to unwrap the definitions of, of what this action is. And so you can write this in a slightly more compact fashion as follows. So for any uh, A over P to the N, which is an element of Z join one over P, uh, I'm gonna write epsilon to the I as shorthand for epsilon to the A uh, P to the N. So epsilon to P to the N is a primitive P to the Nth root of unity. I'm raising it to the power A, which is the kind of operation I'm doing over here. And so then the action is given, given by the following uh, simple looking formula. So G acts on T to the I by epsilon to the I times T to the I for any element I in Z join one over P. I'm just renaming things to make a, a rational number look like an integer. Okay, but one particular consequence of this is that each of these TIs is an eigenspace for the action. It's, get, it's just getting scaled by a unit. So they somehow don't talk to each other, and so you get actually a nice decomposition of uh, the Dirac limit. So therefore, in the limit, we get a decomposition of uh, this coordinate ring of the affinoid perfectoid, which is C to the C T to the plus or minus one over P infinity, is some kind of a direct sum of C times T to the I. The exponents are fractions in Z join one over P, and then there's a completion involved. Uh, so we have this decomposition at the, in the world of vector spaces, but this decomposition by the formula I just wrote down is actually also in the a, a ZP of one equivariant decomposition. So that's and we're going to use this to actually compute certain group cohomology. Uh, so we will end up uh, being interested in the group cohomology of this group acting on this ring. And because of this decomposition, it decomposes into something very simple. And so we'll be computing the group cohomology of this group acting on a one-dimensional vector space. Okay, this example is kind of important, and I'm sorry I had to introduce all this notation, but are there any questions about what I'm talking about? Wonderful. Okay. Um, Right, so what's the basic theorem about the Proetal site? So the basic theorem is that uh, this construction that I just did over here to make a torus perfectoid by finding a Proetal cover of it actually is true in generality. So the theorem is that this site X Proetal is locally perfectoid in a suitable sense. So what I mean is that for all objects U of the site, you can find a cover by affinite perfectoids. So a disjoint union of, uh, let's say, VI is mapping into U, such that VI is affinoid perfectoid. So you can cover every object with affinoid perfectoid objects. So there are enough of them that form a basis for the topology. And so if you want to do certain sheaf theoretic computations, it suffices to work with these affinoid perfectoids rather than general objects of the Proetal site. Uh, and I explained how to prove something like this for a specific example when I was talking about the torus. Uh, the same example works in multiple variables, so it tells you why a torus is covered by something affinoid perfectoid. And then every smooth algebra, every smooth attic space is locally et al over a torus, and so you can use that to pull back uh, covers to smooth objects. It's slightly deeper for singular objects. But I, I don't want to prove this here. 
Okay, so I'll, let's continue our discussion about this uh, X Pro HL. So this is, I guess I've explained uh, why the site is locally perfectoid, and I've given you some idea of what the objects look like, but I haven't really talked about sheaves. So let's, let's do that now. So using this map new from X Pro HL to X et al, which was just saying that regard an HL morphism as a pro HL morphism, you get certain sheaves. So OX, without any decorations, is new inverse of the structure sheaf on OX downstairs, OX et al downstairs. So OX et al is the structure sheaf on the et al side of X, and I pull it back to get a structure sheaf on the et al side of X pro et al. And then OX hat is a completion. Okay, I guess this looks kind of stupid. It's a completion of OX, which means literally what you're supposed to do in order to compute a completion is that you pull back not OX, but rather OX plus, uh, and then complete it in the p-adic sense, and then you invert p. And so these sheaves have a very, very different flavor when you try to work with them. Uh, the first one effectively just looks like the sheaf on the etal side. So if you have some kind of a pro system and you want to evaluate what the sheaf looks like on the pro system, you just evaluate what it looks like on each of the layers and then take a direct limit. Whereas in the second one, you take a completion. And this ends up resulting in a huge difference in their cohomologies. So example, say x is the torus, and I have this object x infinity uh, on the pro etal side, this perfectoid torus, then ox of x infinity is just the non-completed direct limit of the rings that were showing up, c to, c t to the plus or minus 1 over p to the n's, and ox hat of x infinity was the completion, which we called c t to the plus or minus 1 over p infinity. So this is a perfectoid ring. This is just an abstract ring. It's not perfectoid or anything like that. Um. Uh, OK, so you're going to be interested in the cohomology of sheaves in this site. And so, as I said, the OX is just pulled back from the etal side, and the way the formalism works is that the cohomology of a pullback of a sheaf ends up just looking like the cohomology of the sheaf downstairs if you evaluate it on an object that came from below. So, for example, the cohomology of OX on X pro etal is just the cohomology of OX on X etal. So nothing interesting happens. But for X pro etal, uh, something very interesting happens. So the first theorem is that the sheaf OX hat is uh, acyclic on affinoid perfectoids. So it has no higher cohomology. Um, I guess that's probably also, that's also true for OX, uh, but for very different reasons. So I mean, somehow uh, what goes into proving this theorem is the almost purity theorem. So it's a non-trivial statement. But the consequence relevant for us is the following. So consequence. If I give you a torsor, then I can compute cohomology by going up to the torsor. So given a G torsor, U to V uh, with U affinoid perfectoid, like our favorite example of this perfectoid torus. Uh, this theorem over here plus basic check theory tells you that the cohomology of uh, OX hat on this object V is just given by the continuous group cohomology of the group G acting on OX hat evaluated on this ring U. So, okay, this takes a few seconds to unravel what's going on here. Uh, if you're working in algebraic geometry and you have a G torsor for a finite group G and the thing upstairs has no higher cohomology, then you can compute the cohomology downstairs as the G invariance of the cohomology upstairs, which is just G invariance of the sections upstairs. And so this is a version of that statement in this world of Proetal uh, sites of attic spaces. Uh, but somehow you have to be careful about what I mean over here. So there's a natural topology. And the action of G is continuous for the natural topology, and I'm doing continuous group cohomology uh, in that sense. We'll, we'll see an example when I do the computation of the cohomology of a torus. Um, and then the second theorem about this pro HL site, which I think is somewhat more remarkable, is um, so, okay, 
If you think about the sheaf OX, uh, this looks like a sheaf. It's, it's a coherent sheaf. You expect that it's sort of it's cohomology. Sorry, Brian has a question. Ah, oh, sorry, I should have said. So G is profinite. Is that okay? Yeah. I am only going to apply this to ZP of one uh, in, in this lecture. All right, so the second theorem is what does the cohomology of this OX hat not quite look like on affinoid perfectoids, because those are kind of tools, but be really interested in genuine objects of algebraic geometry, things like proper smooth spaces. And what does the cohomology of OX hat look like? Uh, the cohomology of OX just looks like the cohomology I used to from algebraic geometry, from Hartshorn. It lives in degree zero through the dimension at most, and it's sort of computed by check cohomology on affines. Um, but the cohomology of OX hat turns out to be miraculously sort of twice as large. It's a tall cohomology. So this is, I think, what Peter calls the primitive comparison theorem. So let's say x over c is proper, then the cohomology on the pro-etal side of OX hat is actually the same as the cohomology uh, of, as the etal cohomology, scalar extended to the ground field, so that it makes sense. And so, this is somehow where part of the magic is happening, because you're interested in this some, on the right-hand side, which is coming from topology or some kind of etal theory, and the left-hand side is sort of much closer to coherent sheaf theory and to algebra, and we sort of made a connection between the two over here. And I'm not going to explain the proof, but maybe I'll say what the proof is a much harder uh, version of. So the proof is a much harder version of something more familiar from uh, Kersey P geometry. So the Kersey P statement is the following. So say K is an algebraically closed field of Kersey P. X over K is proper. Then HI of X with FP coefficients can be computed as a set of all elements X in HI of X OX such that F of X equals X. Uh, F is for Banius. So there's this statement, and there's another statement about passing to perfections, which I won't write down. Um, but so the way you prove this statement in characteristic P geometry is via the arden schreier sequence. And Peter essentially exploits that idea. But in order to use the arden schreier sequence, you need to sort of know something about these objects. You need to know they're finite dimensional, which is not at all clear for these guys. So a lot of the work actually goes into proving that this guy is finite dimensional. And then you sort of try and repeat this argument. But so I guess maybe this, uh, the study group tonight can try to prove. Uh, for uh, this theorem, uh, it's in uh, Peter's uh, Piatic Hodge theory for rigid analytic varieties paper. OK, uh, what's the time situation? Great. OK, so let's go back to what my actual plan was. I wanted to explain why the Hodge state spectral sequence was connected to the Loray spectral sequence for this morphism. I've described the morphism nu from x pro etal down to x etal, and I've told you why the cohomology of the structure sheaf looks like the cohomology on the etal side, looks like etal cohomology. So I've told you why the E infinity terms look like what they should look like, but I haven't told you why the E2 terms look like what they should look like. So let's talk about the E2 terms. So I guess this is part three, differential forms. Uh, so, for this discussion, you don't, so for the theorem I mentioned over here, you don't actually need x to be smooth, uh, just proper. Uh, for the discussion with differential forms, you want to assume x smooth, because otherwise differential forms are a weird thing. Um, so let's say x over c is smooth of dimension d, uh, and I have this morphism nu from my pro et side. And it's actually a morphism of ring sites, so let me write it like so, which goes from x pro et al to x et al. And we want to understand uh, the push forward of OX hat down to the etal site as a sheaf of OX modules. And so the theorem of the proposition is, uh, let's call it theorem, is as follows. So first, R1 new lower star OX hat is locally free. So it's a vector bundle of rank D. And secondly, uh, taking cup products gives you an isomorphism with the exterior algebra. So wedge I of R1 new lower star OX hat is the same as RI 
new lower star. What's well, hat? Uh, so in particular, for i equals zero, I'm saying that r zero new lower star o x hat is. O, uh, I guess I'm not saying anything interesting in that case. Uh, sorry. So for i equals zero, it's also true. I guess that new lower star o x hat. No, I am saying something interesting. Sorry. Right. So let, consider the second equality when i equals zero. When i equals zero, the left, the right hand side is the push forward of o x hat. And the left-hand side is wedge zero of something. Wedge zero of something is always the ring you're working over, which is OX et al. So what I'm saying here is that new lower star of OX hat is just the structure sheaf downstairs, which is actually a non-trivial statement. And that already uses smoothness. Uh, and then the higher statements are saying that you sort of look like you should look like if you were to be related to differential forms. So the, roughly the theorem says that uh, RI new lower star OX hat has the same size. as omega i of x over c. Of course, this is not an argument. You have to actually find a map between them that is inducing such an isomorphism uh, with a Tate twist. Uh, but at least it's a step in the right direction. OK, so I want to explain roughly what goes into proving this. And what goes into proving this is you, it's a local statement. So it suffices to prove it when x is sufficiently small. Uh, and when x is sufficiently small, it's a tile over a torus. And so you somehow make a reduction to the case of a torus, and then by another argument, you reduce to the case of one dimensions if you want. So the key case, so uh, reduce to showing the following in the case of dimension one. So let's say x is actually just the torus, which is spa of c t to the plus or minus one, and then the same thing with OC. Uh, and since these gadgets are coherent sheaves, and I'm working, or are supposed to be coherent sheaves, and I'm working with something affinoid, uh, I can forget about sheaves and actually just talk about global sections. So it suffices to prove that H1 is uh, free of rank 1, and H0 is free of rank 1. So, uh, right. I mean, you have to prove slightly more than that, but that's roughly what you have to do. So, right. HI of X pro et al. OX hat is supposed to be free of rank 1 if i is equal to 0 or 1 and is 0 otherwise. Because the exterior algebra on a one dimensional vector space sits in degrees 0 and 1. So this is uh, what the output should look like. And in fact, so in this case, it's locally free. In general, it's supposed to be like omega 1. So omega 1 is free if you're over, et al over a torus, but not in general. And so let's actually try to uh, understand this statement and prove it. And this is where we used uh, the objects I introduced earlier. So we had the ZP of one torsor. Um, I guess I called it X infinity to X. And I called this pi. And I said earlier that since x infinity is affinoid perfectoid, and this is a torsor for a group, you can compute the cohomology downstairs by just taking the group cohomology of the ring you have upstairs. And so the earlier discussion tells us that the object we're interested in, which is hi x pro et al o x hat, is actually just hi of the group acting, which is zp of 1, in the continuous sense, on the ring you have upstairs, which is o x hat of x infinity. OK, but this was very explicit. So this is hi continuous of zp of 1 acting on this ring, which was c adjoined t to the plus or minus 1 over p infinity. And I gave you an eigenspace decomposition for this. And so it was a decomposition indexed by powers of t that show up. And it was an eigenspace decomposition, so you can move the direct sum outside. But a slight argument. So, so I, the exponents range in uh, their fractions with only p's in the denominator. And then on the inside, you have the continuous group cohomology. What? Hi. <laughs> uh, well, I guess I call this J, and maybe there'll be another I soon, because I'll forget. T to the J. Um, so again, what I'm saying here is that this guy decomposes as a direct sum, and so the direct sum pulls out, except everything is completed and continuous, so you have to be careful when you do things like that. Um, but each of these guys is an eigenspace, and I know what the eigenvalue is. 
So the group ZP of one is a cyclic, group, is a, is a cyclic free group topologically. So the co to compute the cohomology of just Z, if you forget about all uh, the topology on the groups, if you just have the discrete group Z, the way you compute its cohomology is via the Kazool complex, where you look at the module mapping to itself via the generator minus one, because that's how you compute the cohomology of Z, because the group algebra is a one-dimensional ring, if you like. Uh, the same discussion applies in this continuous context as well. So these continuous cohomology groups are computed as so. So J lives in Z join one over P hat, and then you're looking at HI of a two-term complex of the generator minus one acting on these modules over here. So C T to the J, generator minus one, C T to the J. Okay, but we wrote down what the generator was doing on these eigenspaces. So let's actually recall what it is. So this is the direct sum with the same values, C J M one over P, H I, C T to the J. Uh, on the J, so if, if G corresponds to uh, compatible system one, epsilon P, epsilon P squared, et cetera, then here you had epsilon to the J was the action of G. So you do epsilon to the J minus one, uh, acting on this one-dimensional vector space. Okay, but now you're in good shape, right? So if you look at the j's, which are integers, which have no fractions in them, then epsilon to the j is just zero. Because if you remember how epsilon to the j was defined, you looked at the denominator and looked at how many powers of p that had, looked at the corresponding root of unity, and then raised it to the power in the numerator. But if there is no denominator, then you get nothing. If you like, whatever I'm doing is supposed to be a module over c adjoined t to the plus or minus one. So T and its powers have to be invariant under the group action. So for the sum ends that are indexed by J and Z, you actually just get the complex of the zero differential. And then for the rest, minus Z, uh, what happens? Uh, the differential is now non-zero, because if you have a fraction, you're doing a pth root of unity to some power, minus one, but that power is never the power that was in the denominator. So if you had something like one over p, you're doing a p through of primitive p through of unity minus one, which is not zero. If you had p squared, you do primitive p through of primitive p squared through of one minus one, but it's never zero. And since it's never zero and you're working over a field, that means that all those maps are isomorphisms. And so there is no cohomology. So this guy is actually quasi-isomorphic to zero. So it has no higher cohomology. And so at the end, you can just come out completely ignore the sum end. And what you're left with is just this sum end, which looks an awful lot like what you want which is the ring that you had uh, sitting in degrees zero and one. So this looks like uh, just C adjoin, sorry. Well, let me go to the next slide. So the output, if you sort of go through all of this, is that it looks like uh, I equals zero one and a zero otherwise. So in other words, the first cohomology group and the zeroth cohomology group are free of rank one over the ring, and then in higher cohomology there's nothing, and there's no torsion or nothing mysterious going on, which is exactly what the proposition was saying. Uh, so the proposition was this statement over here, that HI is free of rank one in degree zero and one, and zero otherwise. Uh, and so this is somehow the key computation that goes into proving uh, a lot of these p-adic comparison theorems, uh, that you can compute, um, the cohomology on affinite perfectoids explicitly by reducing to the case of a torus and doing this a computation like this, and you end up getting an answer which looks like it has the right size to be related to differential forms. Uh, I wanted to explain what the actual connection with differential forms is, like how you produce a map from differential forms into these cohomology groups, but that would require introducing the cotangent complex and doing a bunch of stuff, which I don't think I can do in whatever small amount of time I have left. So I think I'll probably just stop here. So uh, in case, instead of using the cotangent complex, suppose you just wanted maybe in coordinates, you could maybe define some construction directly right. to relate things to differential forms, but then would it just be a tremendous nightmare to try to check things are intrinsic? Well, I think you should ask Peter. He did this in one of his papers, and I think he told me it was a pain. But, uh,
the first proof that these things are differentials was actually this way that I wrote down the map and coordinates and then checked it's independent of the choice. But it's it's a nightmare. <laughs> Maybe as a reference, this is a uh, survey for the CDM somewhere. Uh, other questions? So when you were defining an affinoid perfectoid cover, it looks like you require um, this limit of the uh, terms to be perfectoid on the nose, but earlier we saw this like notion of tilde equivalence where you have this limit of attic spaces and you don't require it to be perfectoid on the nose, you just require this, you know, homeomorphism satisfying the skirt certain condition. Um, I, I, why don't, does it not make a difference if you sort of weaken affinoid perfectoid to just require that the limit be like tilde equivalent? I never said that the affinoid perfector was a limit of the UIs. I just wrote down what the coordinate ring should be if it was supposed to be a limit, and then said that the coordinate ring was perfectoid to precisely get around this kind of issue of talking about inverse limits. Okay, so we'll end there so you guys can have a break. We will start again promptly at 11.30. Let's thank Bhargav again. Thank you.